Maureen Jennings is the acclaimed author of Murdoch Mysteries. She joins author and singer Miriam to discuss these, the Tom Tyler Mysteries, and her latest female police procedural heroines, Christine Morris, forensic profiler, and Charlotte Frame, P.I. Hello, everybody. This is Writer's Block with Miriam, and I'm absolutely delighted to have on the show today the wonderful Maureen Jennings. Now, Maureen is originally from Birmingham, born on Eastfield Road in Birmingham. She migrated to Canada at the age, the tender age of 17 with her mother. And she is, of course, known to us as the author of the incredible Murdoch Mystery series. Is it 13 books now that you've written on Murdoch? 13 altogether? Uh, no, uh, Murdoch, uh, seven and a half, which is a novella. Mm -hmm. um, two other series. I've written 14 books, and Murdoch Show has had three movies of the week, and we're now in our 14th season. In the 14th? It's just amazing. She has created female PIs. She has so many wonderful, wonderful scripts and series and we'll, we're going to go through those now. Maureen, you are so welcome to the show. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you. It's been great. Now, you've been to Ireland. You've got a, a family connection with Ireland. Would you like to tell us? That's through your grandmother. Would you like to tell us? Yes. Uh, recently, I, I, we did a little genealogical tree and I always thought it was my grandma, Annie McHale, but in fact, she came, she was, she moved to Birmingham before her, everybody was in County Mayo. And, oh, uh, County Mayo, that's where my family's originally from as well. I've never been there. One of these days I will. But, but if you've ever done genealogy, because I don't know them and I'm dissociated a bit from them, it's like reading an incredible story. And you go, what? She was, uh, this particular auntie was only about 19 and became a housekeeper, a live-in housekeeper to this fairly wealthy man. And of course I go, oh. <laughs> Interesting. That's, an, uh, that's another story. <laughs> right there so that, that fun. yeah wonderful and did she go to the uk how did how, did your family come from ireland to the united kingdom or or yes the, there was quite a large irish population in birmingham even yes. when i was so i'm not quite sure why better work maybe or more work most so likely they all went there and it was easy to get to yes uh, so they moved there and then married Englishman, I guess, eventually. Well, yeah. I know Birmingham quite well because when, when I migrated from Spain uh, with my first husband, he was English. He, he wanted to go back to the UK. We went to York and I did quite a lot of work in Birmingham. So I was doing that drive from York to Birmingham quite a bit. Um, right. And it struck me afterwards, gosh, you know, that must have been at 17. That must have been quite a thing to make the decision to go to Canada with your mom. Yeah. Yes. It was, well, well, my mother's older sister had a long time ago immigrated to the States and then moved to Windsor, uh, Ontario. And rather in a fantasy, she kept telling my mom how wonderful she'd have food, <laughs> um, both of which were lacking in post-war England. So my mom dreamed about it for years and so did my other relatives. I had some cousins who came over, as we always put it. Um, and wasn't there quite a strong promotional drive then for Canada? Absolutely there was. Literally the land of milk and honey. It's better yeah. here. It's better. Here. And it wasn't, of course, at that time. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was really, but we thought about it for a long time. My mom kept talking about it, and uh, it may, I'll just ramble. I ramble a bit. Okay, so my, my aunties, um, my, my mom's cousins ran a pub in the country, and, and uh, 
They dreamed about, it's another story. They dreamed about Canada a lot and they were a little bit superstitious. They were very Catholic, but they were superstitious. So yes. on the closing afternoons when the club closed, they would all pile up into one of the rooms and do the Ouija board. Oh! Will, <laughs> will I go to Canada? Yes! And they oh, did. very good, very good. And hoping that the curate wouldn't be knocking at the door saying, what are you up to there? <laughs> Get that Ouija board out of here. They didn't seem to find it, it, it you know, a contradictory because they go to church, do mass, but there, I never forget it. There was the little thing in the dark. In will the dark. I go to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you get to Canada. How easy that's... is it for you to settle there? Well, we went to Windsor, uh, Ontario. And at the time, it was very economically depressed. So I was only 17 and just out of school. So I didn't have a skill as such. And was considering I, I was groomed to go to university. That was the fact of it. So um didn't quite know what to do my mom couldn't find a job and she didn't have any particular skills either it was tough it was really tough it was not happy and then she one day which i'll never forget i came home oh i know i got a job working at the bell telephone company because i had a nice english accent and oh think, of course that would have been very attractive to people Good morning. This is your service representative. Oh, lovely. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And the thing is, just listening to you there, you haven't you haven't um, acquired a very Canadian accent. There's still quite a lot of the British in there. Is there? I can't tell anymore. <laughs> you know, when you're 17, you want to fit in. So believe me, I... I... Oh, you did try. I bet. I bet. So you, you move on then. At what point uh, did you become um, a psychotherapist? That was a bit late. I was truly, okay. So then my mom said I could go to university, which clearly I should be doing. So I went to Windsor, uh, when it was called a Samson University at the time. And it was run by the Brazilian father. So it was very Catholic. Uh, which I liked. I mean, they were they were such hunky men. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of them are. <laughs> they were. They were in their thirties, and they were physically very. Oh, it was amazing. Anyway, but they were priests. So unfair on us, isn't it? You know, they they put us into a situation where you've got all of these, you know, attractive men, and you're not allowed to have any of them. Well, a bit loose there. I mean, we were attractive young women and, you know, <laughs> anyway, so I was there and then I still didn't know what to do. Um, so I went to teacher's college and then I taught for two years, went back to get my graduate degree, which for another two years, and then taught at a college for six years. Okay. So all of this while and at the same time, very interested in psychotherapy, uh, needed therapy, felt I needed therapy. I did. I was very lost. Okay. Uh, my true love broke my heart and, you know, that sends you into therapy right away. Oh, so. I know. Yes. <laughs> Been there. My heart is broken. Well, that's life, kid. Too bad. <laughs> I know. Isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? I remember my first love broke my heart and I, I got my very first nocturnal panic attack that night. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> so that was a big break. And th those can kind of surface. And, you know, believe it or not, Maureen, after all these years, when COVID started, I was about three weeks into COVID when I had another nocturnal panic attack. And it goes right back to when my heart was broken all those years ago. Right. I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> Panic attacks are horrible. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, okay. Anyway. But you know, it is interesting how many authors have had a situation in their lives where something has come about that has, you know, shifted their consciousness or has shifted um, their, 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 uh, caused some kind of damage and that has spurred them on to become writers. Right. Well, 
I think with myself, uh, being British and of a certain generation, I was always meant to be a writer, probably. But at that time, as a female, you could be a nurse, a secretary, a housewife, uh, a, a maid, I guess. No one would have said, what about writing? You love to read, you write. Well, no, it wasn't even on the radar. So it took a long, I call it a long and winding path where I finally faced the fact that this was my cellular makeup. Yes. Was be in books and trying to write them and stuff like that but that took a long time oh, so I'm uh, sure yeah so i mean what was that what was the trigger for you to to actually take this more seriously then had you gone into teaching literature at, at some point or was there a well actually i i know exactly what it was because uh i was doing therapy i did it for quite a long time yes and as I say, I often thought I, you know, there was the path, and I'd end up retired with a nice clock from all my grateful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Not a bad plan. <laughs> Not a bad plan at all, Maureen. But in the meantime, I began to uh, do what I call creative expression groups, which were absolutely wonderful. It just almost happened, almost accidentally. So that went on for a few years. And then I thought, wait a minute, here am I helping people find their creative, unique selves, and I'm not doing it myself. And I felt that was a touch of hip hip hypocrisy, really. Uh, so I said, okay, never mind. I've got to try it myself. So that's how I did it. It started like that. That is wonderful. Yeah. And I think that's something a lot of people can identify with. You know, you, you find yourself in that situation and that inner voice is screaming at you, isn't it? It's literally screaming at you. My, my goodness. My, my shh. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to that stage now where you're thinking about what you'll write, I'm sure. Yes. Were the police procedural um, novels, were they something that you were into at the time? How did that come about? Um, yes and no. Like I read forever. And my favorite books tended to be the crime genre. So I was very, very familiar. I did all the, the classic Brits. And, but I wasn't really thinking like that particularly. And then one day a good friend of mine who was an actor was working with a, um, a company, and he, a theater, and he said, uh, they need a play. And you love plays, which I did. You love mysteries, which I did. Why don't you write a mystery play? <laughs> People oh, thought. so you went down the mystery play route first. I did. Oh. I absolutely did, yeah. And that was really the huge step forward into taking myself seriously. The plays did well. I learned a lot. And so when that was done, there were two plays I thought, well, I don't want to let this go. So I just, yeah. it was an easy transition into William Murdoch. There he was. My he goodness. Didn't on, he didn't start on the boards. He started, there was a different detective then. No, no, he didn't. I mean, it was absolutely, yes, I remember the original series there. It was just fantastic. Um, and, and I noticed how some, some of the, um, some of the actors that were originally, you know, in, in the movies, they have in some ways followed you around, haven't they? You know, you've got... Yes. You mean Peter Adderbridge? Yes. He was the yeah. original uh, Murdoch. And oh, he's yeah. popped up in so many other things that you've, you've been involved in, in and you've cast him in different things. It's just an extraordinary actor, isn't he? He's just a wonderful, wonderful Lord. actor. Uh, may I tell a Peter story here, Mary? Oh, yes, you may. Go ahead, please. Because he's the quintessential actor, I think. So first of all, he reads, as a writer, you love this. He reads very carefully the books. There were only four books out at the time. So he read those very carefully. Um, and in the books, Murdoch has a mustache, because they all did in those days. Yes. Well, Peter, as the actor, says, well, you know, 
I have to have a mustache, right? And apparently the production team were going, oh no, because he's very fair. And uh, the mustache didn't look so good apparently. And the story is that somebody said to him, people don't trust detectives with mustaches, which I don't think is true, but anyway. So then they had to shave it off and ah. he started to act like the king. He bought into it. He bought into it anyway. No, but he was. I mean, yeah. Peter Otterbridge was just the most wonderful Murdoch as well. And Colin Meany was with him. You know, he, he was cast in it as well. Those, was it three or four your, that, that they did? Three, the first three or four novels that they, they shot? Three. Yes, three movies of the week. They were, yeah, the, all of them adaptations Great. from the books. Yeah. All adaptations. How true did they stay to? I mean, did they bring you in as a consultant immediately? Not really. I mean, I was there, but no, not really. They, were, for one thing, they were filming out in Winnipeg, which so it wasn't easy to drop in. Um, no. I should wave at your husband in the background there because. <laughs> <laughs> should say hello to him. <laughs> Hi. Hello, how are you? Very nice to very nice to meet you, Miriam. Hi Miriam, yeah. We, we miss Ireland. We want to come back right away. Oh show sure, yes. <laughs> Oh yes, show us. Show us that. You you were on holiday, both of you in Ireland, weren't you? And we'll just shout out to our friend Owen Pierce, who was the one of the uh, he was the driver of the bus that uh, where we toured, I don't know, where was it we went? We went up the coast and we viewed where you two lived and things like that, you know. Oh, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. So you were in Dublin. You would have done that tour in Dublin. Yes. You'd yes, have done the bus tour in Dublin all the way around. And, and then... Owen and I are, <laughs> are now good buddies and we, we think we're related all the way back to this 5th, 17th century or something. You know? Oh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> He's a Pierce and my family is a Pierce as well. So there you go. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, no, I tell you, you'll find you've got relatives coming out of the woodwork now when this goes out. When you see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you indeed. Gosh. So you had a great time in Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, we did. Yeah, we really did. We loved it. It was funny because when we got there, we were a little tired. We'd been in England for a couple of weeks and it was just, I don't know. We kept saying, oh, we shouldn't be here. We should be wherever. And I then know. the day, we just fell in love with everybody and well, I tell you, if you went to the west of Ireland, you would fall in love with that because I, I, I've, I have just started writing my very, very first, well, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through writing my very first crime uh, novel, and it's based in the west of Ireland in a medieval castle. There's so much inspiration there. There's just so much, the, just the scenery is so inspirational, you know? Yeah. yeah, and and you know it's 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 one of those places I could see you writing something marvelous in Ireland too. <laughs> but just to go back to uh, to Murdoch for a moment, they have um, you you have written apart from and I mean we have we have the stories. I'll just get out of the way, beg your pardon, so that people can see there. The, so you you have your original Murdoch here, Peter right. Outer Ridge, and you also have the the stories, which I, I know they keep changing the covers. But you have the most wonderful um, uh, first three novels, which they uh, adapted as as movies, TV movies. But as you say, you have written about seven scripts for the current series that we're used to for the the incarnation of Murdoch, William Murdoch, that we're used to. Um, and how did you find that? That must have been quite an experience, making a slight adjustment, you know, coming in as, as a writer on a TV series. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, before this, Miriam, I watched your whole interview with Richard Chamberlain. Oh, and he, yes. he talks about the difference of the stage and yes. uh, TV, for instance. And obviously you think, oh, they're sort of the same, they're all acting, but they're so different. They're so, different. so even though I was very familiar with the stage, yes. when I finally uh, got to write a script, it really was different. The similarity is, of course, show, don't tell. You know, that's, yes. 
whether you're on the stage or on the screen. And apparently, as they very tactfully suggested, all of my characters talked too much. So oh. I had to learn to uh, chop it back and chop uh, it back and be more creative with what you show. Yeah. So, yes. So I've learned a great deal from that. And, and of course, there are lots of technical things that don't occur really on stage. But for example, um, this was my very first script and I re it was rather important to the story that there be a big storm. And so I'm writing that, I'm writing that like a, a, a novelist, I'm writing that like a dramas, dramatist, because you don't have to do anything, just make noises, you rattle the sheet, you know, brr, here comes thunder. Brr. But so we're sitting around, on the set and someone says to me one of the producers says well we can't do rain <laughs> it's too expensive <laughs> i'm going oh okay well of course it is yes i never thought about that at all so this was like a little lesson and yeah uh, so they did something where they literally put a hose against the window so nobody gets wet and then that that particular episode, I went onto the set to have a visit and there was a lovely young crewman and he had a little box and they call it the lightning box. And he was literally- The lightning box, yes. <laughs> pressing. Yeah, familiar with those. Yeah. And he All was, these effects, yes. He was having such a good time. <laughs> I keep saying there's more lightning in that show than is natural in the world. <laughs> So a lot of the technical aspects of TV shooting, I had to become aware of. Yes, yes. I truly wasn't. So that you could, you could write around all of that. And then once you know, I'm sure it's, it's a lot easier. <laughs> but then I suppose as well, you have to think about future writing, even with the other, um, the other figures. I mean, you have these extraordinary, um, uh, you have, for example, um, you have Tom Taylor series, which is four novels. I mean, if if that then goes to being filmed, you're you are you at? Does it happen that when you write one of his books, you're starting to think along the same lines? You've got this experience from Murdoch. Would you then find your your working your writing so that okay, if this actually is going to transfer to screen, I better be conscious of this, the rain, whatever. Yes. I, I think uh, that is absolutely true. Um, a very nice, very good friend of producer friends says, don't worry about it. We'll just write it. Because he's thinking, oh, I can't have an explosion or, you know, don't worry about it. So that's nice. But you kind of keep that in mind for sure. And certainly I think what I've really learned is what will look dramatic because they still talk a lot. I, I think people talk a lot, what the hell? Yes, they do. And and I have to say just, um, I have always referred my students because m although I'm, I'm a singer, one of my fallback careers was English language teaching. And oh, I always, wait. always pointed them in the direction of Murdoch Mysteries because the script, the writing, the clarity of the English, the use of language, it's just fantastic. For any mm -hmm. adult who's trying to improve their, their language skills, you know, for business or whatever, they find it very difficult sometimes to tune into British television because British people tend to speak very quickly. Yes. So they, they and, and sometimes they, they struggle a little bit with American English, but Canadian English and particularly a program mm -hmm. that is, a, is period, such as Murdoch Mysteries, absolutely wonderful. It's just, and, mm -hmm. and it, it's just, you bring in, they, in this series, in particular, they have specialized in bringing in quite modern comical themes at times into something that's period. Like, I remember there was the series about golf, which was golf. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About golf, which right. the, the humor of which all of these young people, well, and not all of them so young, but they, they were able to understand, they were able to comprehend. So, I mean, I, I love Canadian programs. I love the way people write for television over there and 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 the talent the acting talent that is available is just yes. outstanding it's I mean, very I, deep yes the deep. leaders I, to my mind they are leaders in in television over there at the moment i just think it's wonderful, I, I, wonderful. I, 
to say to that, Miriam, because uh, as you know, that there's a team and there's always a team and it's very much the collaboration of people. And uh, my only little narky thing is that sometimes I have to say, wait a minute, they wouldn't have used that word back then, you know, <laughs> but that's all right. And people uh, are good about that. Yes. And, I've been lucky with a very, very good team because it's a long time now. Holy cow. Oh, it's going it's going quite some time now. And and just even just to move on to some of the other wonderful figures that you've you've created. I mean, for example, uh, Christine Morris. Um oh. the profiler. Thank you. Wonderful, 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 wonderful writing. I mean, at this stage, how many books have you? Is it two books? Yes, um, I forensic did, profiler. Yes, and I would happily have gone on, but there was a whole change of scene or something. I don't even know sometimes. So I decided to leave her temporarily having a little hiatus, yeah. which is a TV word, which I like. You're having your hiatus now, Christine. And then I went back to uh, um, Tom Tyler, I guess. Yeah, I think that's what it was. So, so you may yet return to uh, to Christine Morris. You, she's she's on hold, and that's all <laughs> at the moment. But I remember you talking about with regard to Tom Tyler. I think it was the fourth book you had. Uh, that was very special, wasn't it? The inspiration for that fourth book. I, I uh, wasn't that rather unusual. The you had a, um, you know, it just brings me to the whole idea of well, what is the inspiration for the books. That was the treasure, bitterly treasure, right? That, yes. Oh, that was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Because, you know, obviously in England, you can fall over a castle or some treasure at any moment. You know? Oh, here's some treasure. We oh. don't think about it. <laughs> Surrounded by it. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, well, I met this, uh, my friend, I have some dear friends in England, we grew up together, they're still there, and she introduced me to Howard Murphy, who is a detectorist, and the most, one of my absolute favorite shows has become The Detectorists, which I think they've stopped at the moment, I find it hilarious. Anyway, so he was detecting, and he came, he found this treasure in a field near Bitterly, which is where my friend lives. And it turned out to be treasure from King Charles, the, the Civil War period. Oh. And uh, it wasn't a lot, but it was substantial. It was about this much, about I think there were 137 coins, gold oh. and silver. And it's astonishing. And of course, they were saying to me, the archeologist and Howard said, we don't know how it got there. And I go, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> ah, says I. Anyway, so I, I did my research and, um, uh, and that's how the book developed. And I was able to go, because it's still in Bitterly, I was able to go to the little museum and actually hold that, coin in my hand and oh it was my. yeah so. yeah and these and things it, mean a lot to someone like you that would mean so much you know because it's it's a it, it's just it's it's the it's the trigger for the ideas and it's the it's wonderful and there was a person there who clearly needed to bury that treasure and of yes. course then you just go into the whole life of somebody why yes. they I only use that as a prologue because it's set in 42, but in my story, the treasure lies there, which it did. I mean, it's unbelievable that it was never discovered for 300 years, but it just yes. lies there. And in my story, it comes to life. They find it. It's just a one, it, that's really inspirational, isn't it? It's just really so well. inspirational. And we went there. We, I, so I should have brought the pictures, but, um, you know, you've created something out of all of this. You know, we went created... to the field, the actual field where this unknown person actually buried that treasure. It was in a little pot in a leather pouch with these coins. And you say, why did he bury it? Yes, yes. And then it begins. 
that's wonderful yeah now so uh, but just do you find because i i i found when uh, particularly with murdoch mysteries you get inside the mind of people and you bring out their creativity so well and that this is something that happens in your other books too does the the fact that you had this other career as a psychotherapist do you feel it does at all feed in to this to this writing process i think so and i hope so because um there was a marvelous book long before i was writing called the seven percent solution and it's fiction is nicholas meyer and he in his story poor old sherlock holmes with his terrible addictions yes. consults sigmund freud and it's such a clever idea as to trying to explore on a deeper psychological level why Holmes is like that. And uh, in a certain sense, therapy can be like a mystery story because, you know, someone comes and they don't know why they're having panic attacks, for instance. You know? yeah. and they truly don't know. So part of the journey is to help that person find why there's always a why why are you so insecure why do you are bad at relationships why 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 and and i know you i i love that interview with richard chamberlain by the way and i know oh, you thank you ah oh, he's mr wonderful isn't he he's a great person fantastic he, actor you were both very honest about having alcoholic parents yes yes huge impact on the psyche oh huge huge, huge. so so and sometimes that's known someone says yes yes you know my father was alcoholic but to understand what that meant to their current issues that's like a mystery something yes yes oh like, and i mean uh, just you mentioned panic attacks there i mean i you know I'll, I'll get up on stage and i'll do my thing but i have suffered from panic attacks all my life and it has taken me until i'm 55 to figure out why <laughs> but at least i figured it out it's, it's it's actually the the figuring out part isn't i suppose for the person who goes through it isn't actually the, the biggest deal at the time you just you think you're going to die and you work out a way you, you have to work out a way of actually getting yourself through that half hour <laughs> or whatever it ends up being yeah. and when you've got that blueprint you feel you do feel a lot stronger but you definitely have to have if you do go to see someone you have to have someone with the right approach and yes. I mean, I can talk, you know, about this forever, but I know just, just listening to you, you would have been a fantastic therapist. I can just <laughs> tell, you know, you'd have instilled creativity and confidence and, and strength in people because you have it emanating from you as well as from your writing. So, I mean, I'm sure there are so many people out there who miss you in that role. <laughs> yeah. I made sure they had good people to go. To. Can I quote you? Hang on. I'm being a bit perverse here. Uh, quote you talking somewhere. Sorry, it's about creativity. No, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's about the healing property of creativity, you yes. know, and that it's so easy to think that creativity is painting and music and singing, but that's one, fat, one part on the spectrum of how to be creative. And I absolutely believe no matter what trauma we've gone through if we can live from that place it's going to heal us yeah and sometimes we just need to we need a bit of reminding you know of what worked for us before because we're, we're all very good when we once when, when we come through something bad we're very good when we've come out the other end putting it putting it away forgetting it about it <laughs> and not remembering what worked for us when when you know kind of when things went bad and and I know, well, just not to focus too much on me for a moment, I apologize, but, but I know when I come back to this often and off, uh, over and over again in my life, your talents heal you. Your talents really heal you and not to let them go. And I, you know, I must say my mother, she was a wonderful painter. She was a professional artist all her life and she never let go of that. But other friends of hers did. They got so engrossed in raising their children and looking yeah. after their families and they just forgot themselves and they right. forgot what they were originally born with. Yes. You know, as, uh, which, and, and had to find it again later. And then it's very, it's very difficult to do. Not impossible, 
Mm. But I, I always say to to my friends and, and to people, never, ever let never let go of your talents. Because, you know, your children won't thank you for it. <laughs> they, they want their, their mom and their dad to be doing what they're good at. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Now, but getting back to your wonderful writing, okay, you you created Christine Mars, wonderful, wonderful figure. You'll come back to her, but you've also created another female uh, PI, Charlotte yes. Frame. Tell yes. us more about her. She's wonderful. I loved her. She was kind of a bit of an inspiration for me actually um, during the last year because I had put um, Grace O'Malley, the the one that I'm working on at the moment, I put her to bed for a little while, and I came back to her after I read um, the book heatwave and it was oh. just gorgeous it was gorgeous tell us about her and how different she is to the other um the other uh, the forensic pathologist um that you, you wrote about in christine morris yes that actually started as others often do with a short story um a friend of mine was has a magazine and he said I, I, could you give me a short story? And but it should be set as um, noir, which means oh. a certain period of time, yeah, twenties, uh, thirties. So I, I found I started to read about that period. It was so interesting. And then because it was noir, police procedures don't tend to be noir in no. that classical sense. So I yes. thought, okay, I need a private investigator, and. I'm sort of fed up with being a guy. I want to be female. Uh, so I did. So I thought, okay, she'll be female. She'll be a private investigator. 1936 made oh, limitations and, and other things. So that's how it sort of started. And that's then, a great, it's a great period to start it in too, the 30s. I love anything written and based in the 30s really interesting period so there she was so she appeared and it was nice to write in the first person which is different yes it was nice to write you know my female point of view the fe feminine gaze as they call it here yes like the feminine gaze and 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 also changing age group changing and also i've often found that and i've said it before to people if you're if you're a female author and you're able to write in a male voice. That's quite a gift. You're very good at doing that. It would, that's what prompted the question about the psychotherapy and how that feeds in, because you would have a very, very good understanding, apart from your literature understanding, your literary understanding of how to change voices. Um, but I'm really looking forward. So uh, the is it, have you written two yes. Charlotte Frames? So it's two, so the, the, the rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in November. That's that's done. That's being nicely, tactfully edited by my tactful, nice editor. Oh, wonderful, wonderful! Now, can I just move you on for a moment to uh, to Bomb Girls? Oh yes, please. Oh, this is just wonderful. I love it. I just love it. And you know, that just <laughs> so many different aspects to this. Um, there's, there's quite a, a focus on sexuality, the focus uh, between um, Betty and her girlfriend on uh, lesbianism, um, the idea that everybody's at war, but we're all going through our own struggles. You know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I'll just get out of the way for a moment so that people can see. The cast line up there is phenomenal. So what's the... So who were the main writers on this again? I thought you had a collaboration on this. Well, it was a funny process. A good friend, Deb, who is a makeup artist on Murdoch. Oh, had, oh. Had this project for many years because her grandmother was a bomb girl. And oh. by sheer chance, we, we were on the set and we didn't know each other. And she said to me, what are you working on? And I said, this was book two in the Tyler series. I said, set in Birmingham. And I said, I'm working on a story about a munitions factory. And she looked at me with that look, you know, oh. <laughs> anyway, so we got together and we did it, what a pitch. Yes. And uh, it was taken up by uh, uh, producers, Adrian Mitchell and Janice. 
and it became Bomb Girls. But we actually didn't write on the show. They didn't, didn't write on the show, so okay. So, but we did we how go. did you feel that? The, how did you feel it turned out in the end? Was it was it what you hoped for? Was it was it? Uh, y yes and no. Uh, there's always yes and no, right? Yeah. Uh, I I would myself like to have seen more about the women's life in the factory. Yes. Because that's where we start. That that was to me the vibrant thing. But you know, as a producer, you always have to have some eye on commercial and um, what would people watch. So I think the tendency was to shift it slightly more into war and so on and so on, which was fine. But I certainly thought that you can see those women there, and we were able to meet. Um, several women who had been bomb girls and oh that was absolutely oh. fantastic so now you you have mentioned to me maureen that there's a possibility of this becoming a musical well deb my partner is very very musical and uh, has written songs and she actually said to me how about if we try to make this concept the factory and the girls into a musical and i said "Ooh, that sounds good so, <laughs> so we're, that, gives we're, you, that gives you the opportunity then to take the factory back to the factory you know to actually ride it the way you want <laughs> put it that i really like <laughs> give it back to me <laughs> but that. i was very it was very popular and i wish we could have gone on actually but yes it's all to, a lot to do with money and you know it's expensive of course, but yeah. I can imagine. Can you imagine the music that could come from a musical? Oh. This? this would be fantastic. Oh my! I, I thought I really I hope it happens for you. Thank you. Well, she phoned me and, and she said, and "I go, woo, yeah." And we've been doing it for a good year now, and of course, uh, we've got some great songs. We are the Mom Girls. Oh we really? Yeah, yeah. We got some great songs. So we'll see. Oh, that would be fantastic. So, so when when do you think we'll know? When will we know whether or not we're going to see? It through everything up in the air, right? Everything yes. closed, we're moving nicely, and then literally the door slammed. So I don't know yet. We're hoping to do um, a read through, sing through, just to see what have we got in November. We'll see, and after that, we'll see. You need a full orchestra, a full orchestra for, for some... We need a singer. <laughs> you need a singer. If you need a singer, I'm there. <laughs> but come on over. I'll go on over. Oh, yes, I will. There we are. Now. Vatican. Right. There we are. Now we've got our Laura dance. <laughs> and yourself. And there she is. Laura was... This is my backyard, by the way. Is it? Yes, because it was a small show. It was, was a, short, a short, yeah. It was a short. So we used everything, so we shot some of the shots in the house, and these were in literally the backyard, and that's Peter. Yes, yeah. Peter Otterbridge again. And Honestly, he's, he's and uh, he doesn't he re he must be a real favorite if he keeps <laughs> appearing like this. Now this story is very very good. I loved it, and and I thought that you know that the idea of again um, this young woman connecting with her father, and clearly all the damage that had gone on, you know the the incredible story there. That you know he had you know to be honest, he had been quite a monster, hadn't he? But it's a tale of forgiveness too. Uh, yes, yes, I hope so. Yes, a and the importance of that. Um, and you know what was the inspiration for this again i wrote a short story it came from a short story and past because of wartime england i've been all of my life sort of obsessed with random death where you know the bomb drops on you and you're dead yeah and death where you know you're going and you have a chance to have loved ones you know that they're very different and I, it's always obsessed me so in this story, um, 
I do both. One man's dying and he wants to resolve his bad being a bad dad. So that's planned. And then in my story, it doesn't come into the film actually. In my story, uh, there's a random death. Just, boom, you know, you're just literally out there and you're dead. So yes. I think, especially maybe even nowadays with COVID. Yes. Very I wanted to say morbid, but you know, it's like, these are issues we have to think about. We can't plan it. We can't, like me, I just walked a dog and I go, you know, I know, I know, this is it. And, and, and the importance of kind of accepting the situation. She had to accept the situation. She, she, she was on a road to, to forgiveness. Um, and it was just so beautifully shot, but I thought that the screenplay was wonderful. I really thought that that was a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. And I, I, well, Lara herself liked this short story because she had had troubles with an alcoholic father. Yes. And she, she, she really identified with it. And I thought she did a beautiful job. I, that one, except for taking out a random bit, which, yes. you know, I was, that's right. Uh, I thought they did a really good job, and uh, Peter and the, another friend called Everett. I thought they really did that beautifully. Yeah. To uh, and Lara was fantastic. That whole thing, because again, to quote you, I'm oh, sorry, or Pete, uh, Richard Chamberlain, somebody, one of you, when you were talking, I think sorry, it was him, and he talked about the difficulty of guys, men being parents and fathers and that again that's something I go back to over and over and over yep. I've written a play which was all set to happen and then COVID happened yes. which is about that thing how men then less so now had a hard time being fathers and yes, it's really really always interested me so yeah. it, that's Sorry, is in I there. Can, really. I can remember when I was about 26 or 7 and it's suddenly dawning on me that um, some of the difficulties, I'm quite open about this kind of thing at this age, I don't mind saying things, but I remember at 26, 27 years of age, it dawning on me that some of the reasons why I was misinterpreting um, some men and, and, and misreading a lot of men was was because my father was so austere he was such a non-communicator lovely man don't get me wrong my, my father was a wonderful man but he was a man of his generation where they yes. when the the girls and he had two daughters he was the only male in the house he he had two daughters but he was like the lodger in the house <laughs> because he was a man's man and he had, he'd been in the navy and he was in the um aviation business and these were all very male businesses you know yes and he loved the man's world. And so when he'd come home, he was never that relaxed um, at home, you know, and, and that's when he used to drink. But when he went away to work and he was on his 14 hour, 18 hour days and he was with all the guys, he hardly drank. He hardly drank. So if we wanted to be with the best version of our father, we needed to travel with him. And as a result, we were away in all kinds of different places, you know, for months at a time. But I can see what the choice that my mother made. She realized that she would have to kind of disrupt the rest of the family if we were to become a cohesive unit. Because the best place for us to be a cohesive unit and for her children to have those very good memories was of him would be when we were away working with him. Uh -huh. and that made sense to her. But I do remember as, as a young woman in my late 20s saying, you know what, Dad, I love you very much, but I do wish you'd been a little bit more of a communicator because it was sort of, it was definitely, I know I misread a lot of, um, a lot of people in my life, particularly men, because I hadn't got the blueprint, you know, yes. to go by, you know, <laughs> it wasn't there. So yeah, right. men are very important. Dads are very important, you know. So important. Well, I think that it's misread as indifference, you know. It is, uh, and it's not indifference. And, and that's a, the same thing uh, when you go to the alcoholic issues and that come up even in your film there. It's, it, it, it wasn't meant as indifference. It's just the person is unable. They're, they're, they're not able to communicate what they want to communicate because they're addicts. Yeah, yeah, right. And they sure. don't know how. 
they don't know how. In fact, uh, that's a line in the play. I think they use it in the little thing where, where the, the ghost says, um, is he in that one? No, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. In another play, it's a ghost and he, and he says, uh, why didn't he love me? And the ghost says, he didn't know how. He and I thought, know. exactly, that's the thing. It's not that I didn't, I didn't know how. I didn't yeah. know how to show you that, how to act on that. And so that child then ends up feeling, well, he didn't care. You know, man, yes. That can be very yeah. wounded. Yeah. And, and you can, unfortunately, keep replaying that in your head, can't you? And, and believing it. And it's not always accurate. But oh my goodness! I mean, there's just there's there's just so much, so much. You must have sat back at some point and said to yourself, "What has happened in my life? This is the most explosive situation. How since 1997 has my life suddenly turned?" Did you have a eureka moment when you said that to yourself? You're winning all these awards and you're getting all of this acclaim, Maureen. And it must have been there must have been a moment where you said. Really? Has this happened? Has this actually? Like every second day. You know? like, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? No, that's the that's the word. Really? Yeah, no, it's true. I'm again, and I'm not being all you know swarmy, but I I feel very lucky. I feel that it's just a combination of things. Like again, I know Richard Chamberlain said that, and you think, oh yeah. But it's true. When you're at the other end, you say that was a lot of luck. Yes, it was. A, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, you were picked up by CBC, and and even today, I mean, Murdoch Mysteries is all over Alibi here. Um, yeah. I mean, we're, it's on every day, four episodes a day. I think it is at the moment. It's. I mean, and everybody knows you. Everybody knows who you are. You know, and it's it's just. I just think it it must be such a blessing to know that you know your work counts and, and matters in that way. But again, what you bring to your novels is just so amazing. Just tell me about the future. Where, where are you going next? I know you love war. Your oh, themes yes, are very interesting because you've, you've gone down the pr police procedural route, but you do come back to the theme of war quite often. And you've mentioned to me that World War I is of particular interest to you at the moment, as it is myself. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've written a book on on the on World War One. Oh, um, I got that one about the poet. Yes, it has a funny name. I'm not sure I pronounced it properly, but anyway. But you wrote about er, Era's World War One war poet. Yes. Yeah. Ledwidge, which, which, or something. Ledwidge. Ledwidge. Francis Ledwidge. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. No. Uh, what I have on the go at the moment is. If the theater does start to slowly open up, which I hope it will, I really am keen to go on with this one. Um, and this other play about fathers and sons called Dying Like This. Yes. And then uh, at the moment, I'm working with two producers, Kim and Nick, about, it's called The Long Carry. And it's World War I. And the premise is we follow the wounded men right through to the time where they either died or they were sent back to England to recover. And along the way, of course, they had to stop at different places, hospital for one, and we interact with the people who were running the hospital or stretcher bearers or um, one of the things. Oh, that that's wonderful, Maureen. That is a wonderful premise. Oh, I'm so glad because it's just, I, I loved it myself. Oh, absolutely. And it, it really resonates with me because very shortly before my mother died, she wrote a book called Teddy, A True Story. And it was the true story of, of my great uncle, who when he discovered he was illegitimate, um, his, his mother had gone to the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin and she had taken him as a nurse child because that's how they did adoptions in those days. She'd had a baby and she took another baby um from the rotunda and she raised them as twins and when he discovered that he wasn't really a twin he ran off to war oh. he, he 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 basically signed up with the british he was heartbroken and he signed up and he was blown up at the sum he oh. then comes back he's terribly injured but he is sent to canada to recover 
manages to get back walking again and signs up with the Canadians and heads off to Vimy. Right. And he's blown up again. Holy cow. And he, in the end, and what, what happened was he died of his injuries in, in his 40s, but all of his medical records were sent to my mother. Right. And it's a fascinating thing to look at those medical records and read, you know, the matron's report and the surgeon's reports and all of these. So I'm listening to you saying that and I'm getting all excited here because that is actually a really wonderful premise. That would make a great play. Well, one of the things that um, we know that we know the soldiers, we know the nurses, we know the doctors, but there are always, there's always people behind the scenes. Yes. Now, that's what I'm hoping we can focus on. For example, the sanitary men. Now, that's not a glamorous job, but they were so crucial to yes. try to keep these men healthy. And then, of course, the cooks, uh, the stretcher bearers were so courageous most of the time. Oh, oh, gosh, what they saw. Yeah. So that what a story. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Oh, the, the, this would be a great play. I, I, I wish. And what's the what's the working title for this one again? The long carry. The long and carry. It's literally, what they would refer to it because sometimes it was a very long carry for the stretcher bearers when yes. they picked them up, and by the time they got them to the hospital, it could have been as long as three miles. Sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. it's interesting you should say that because they did say in the reports that a lot of the damage to my um, my great uncle would have been because of the fact that he was he wasn't being transported properly. He was in trucks and vans that would have been causing even more damage to his spine. I, I literally was reading that yesterday, the story of two women, real women, and they said, look, if we can treat them early on, that shock of being transported, bumping and jerking will be alleviated. Literally, I read that yesterday. So it's interesting Isn't that, that extraordinary? They, Isn't that? That they said that, yeah. So oh, any, I, any more new characters for us on the way? Are you thinking of introducing any more? Uh, well, the, this, this uh, series, uh, there'll be new characters. And certainly I've been reading a lot about the young women of the time. Uh, there was one, they were called the Fannies, which is the first aid yeomanry, yeomanry, yeoman, yeomanry, yeah. Uh, women or something and they were typically young women of um, upper class because they had to pay their own way if they were not they couldn't afford to go and they had to learn how to drive how to fix the ambulances they were incredible so one of my characters will definitely be a fanny uh, and so I want to focus on her dealing with these things i don't know how they did it yeah i don't know how they did it either but we're in we're in a kind of war now aren't we maureen and when you think about these characters that you're talking about the ones that you feature in bomb girls as well you're you're looking at people who really got so creative who who had to find a way through no matter what and and we're, we're there again it's a slightly different situation but people are having to face distress they're having yes. to face struggle in their own lives right now. They're having to face things they maybe didn't want to face. They're experiencing internal struggles like nobody's business, yes. all because of COVID right now. And, yes. and these stories that you're writing are more relevant than ever, you know? And, and if you focus on war, it will be immediately relevant to the now. Good. I, that's what I feel too. I, I really do. It's still there. What have we got? We've got courage. We've got resilience. Yes. We've got ingenuity. All of and despair and triviality and the whole spectrum of life itself. You know. So. Exactly. I'll just pull out of the way for a moment here. I, I just I thought this was wonderful. There we are. The shooting of Murdoch Mysteries. Okay. The only person. On the floor, the floor manager has got his mask on, but there we are. You've got your your actors there, your... Right. So and they are shooting. And it's, I was just so relieved when I saw that. Oh, listen, they have been marvelous because the restrictions are quite restrictive. Yeah, but so far it's working really well. 
uh, people are in their pods, which means that if anything happened, they could, they'd only have to close down that pod instead of the whole production. Very, very well thought out. I Isn't that marvelous? That. So you've got, you've got a, a, a purpose built, they've got a purpose built um, center now, haven't they? They've got their entire set, their entire location, which is their own now. It's a, yes. Yeah, the back lot, right. Yeah, their own uh, back lot. And they, they have been so good. The disappointment for me is my episode, um, half of the story involved basketball, and that's very unlikely that that will happen now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, said. dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness. Well, Maureen, I am so delighted to have been able to speak with you today. And uh, and, and I just, I'm so glad to see you so well. And, you know, if, do you have a message that you'd like to give people who are, who are wanting to write and perhaps other authors who are, who are just struggling at the moment in COVID and they're, they're just plodding away and they're trying to be as inspirational as they can be and they're trying to get ideas. What would you say to them right now? men or women? Well, as I said earlier, I absolutely believe that if we can live in that creative spot, the ills of the world, never mind the natural world, can't do anything about that, but we wouldn't be fighting, we wouldn't be trying to kill each other, all those things, because you don't need to. Like, if you've just had a delicious meal, you don't envy somebody else, you know? But if you're starving and they're having a cracker, you go, oh, I want that. So if you yourself feel enriched and in that place, you just automatically are generous and happy. You know, it doesn't matter that you're struggling. You might be, oh, this isn't working. You're still happy in that place. I, you absolutely are. So I'm hoping that because so many people have been forced in on themselves without choosing to be, that that's going to start that more feeling people feeling that much more yeah because in some respects i agree with you and that that's that is truly inspirational um why do we have to go back to the old normal why can't we create a new normal and let I, that be it absolutely it should be. why not we're human beings we're not different nationalities or religions you know yeah. covid doesn't look and say well you're a nasty catholic and i'm you know forget that doesn't say that because yeah. oh you're a person i'm gonna attack you so hey we're all in this together That's we are amazing. we are indeed truly inspirational words and i uh, just stay with me for a moment maureen while i sign out oh look wasn't this wonderful today we've had maureen jennings with us on writer's block and she's absolutely fabulous and and i just i can't wait for your next book and i can't wait to see all these projects take off because uh, we're so lucky to have you we're so, so lucky to have you. Everybody be safe, keep well, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.